Hello. We'll be looking at Sonnet 73 by William Shakespeare in this video. Let's look at the sonnet first. Sonnet 73. That time of year thou mayst in me behold, when yellow leaves, O oh none, O oh few, do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold. Where ruined choirs, there late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day, as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away. That second self, that seals a fall in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire, that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as a death whereupon it must expire, consumed with what? which it was nourished by. This thou perceiveth, which makes thy love more strong, to love that well which thou must leave alone. In Sonnet 73, Shakespeare continues his meditation on aging and approaching death. However, one may not be misled and think that Shakespeare was a doddering old man at the time this was composed. It is my belief that there is more than a touch of the hyperbole in his agonizing preoccupation with his age. In the first 12 lines of the sonnet, Shakespeare presents his young friend with three images of himself as an aging man. A bleak late autumn scene, a twilight, and an image of a dying fire. The poet in the first four lines presenting the image of the bleak late autumn says, when his young friend looked at him, he would see an image of those times of the year when the leaves were yellow or have fallen, or when the leaves had no leaves at all so that the bare branches where the sweet birds recently sang shivered in anticipation of the cold winter to come. The, ter the term leaves suggests the number of years left for the poetic person to live. The leaves are yellow symbol of old age and sickness. The, the, the unusual reversal of uh, the term none or few highlights quite poignantly the fear the poetic persona feels about the very little time that he feels that he had lived to do. The references uh, to choirs invokes or evokes an image of a ruined church art that is believed to be divinely inspired by many found its highest forms of expression in churches in Britain during the Renaissance. However, during the reign of King Henry VIII, many of the great churches that sponsored art in Britain were ransacked and destroyed. Therefore, it is quite natural for Shakespeare, who would have seen many of those ruined great churches where great music had been composed and offered to God in choric performances to see the almost leafless branches located by songbirds as ruined church choirs. Reading between lines, this might be an indication of his own fear of losing his own ability to produce and perform art with the onset of old age. An artist who cannot produce and perform art would surely look like a leafless branch or a ruined choir vacated by its occupants. The branches vacated by songbirds could also be read as a reference to those artists who used to seek the poetic persona out when his sap was green. They have left him in his old age. At the same time, this metaphor pays compliment to the receiver of the poem with the illusion that he, he unlike the birds that had left the tree, has not left the aging poet. In lines five to eight, Shakespeare presents himself as twilight. He says that his friend would see in him the twilight that remains after the sunset fades in the west, which by and by is replaced by black night, the twin of death. The poet quite casually slips in a euphemism that signals to his friend that his death might not be too far off when he says that the night that comes after twilight is really 
that second self that seals up all interest. In line five, in lines five to, uh, nine to twelve, Shakespeare compares himself, himself to a dying fire, who invites his friends to see in him the remains of a fire glowing feebly atop the ashes, as if it lay on its own deathbed. The ashes produced by the lo the logs, which ultimately smother the the fire. The term ashes recalls to the mind the Christian burial prayer, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, further cementing the idea that things born must eventually die. The Renaissance was an age that wholeheartedly encouraged <coughs> the practice of the late class classical philosophy, Carpe Diem. It is believed that Shakespeare himself died of a fever contracted after a bout of heavy drinking with his friend Ben Jonson. So, being reduced to an old wreckage, robbed of his music, would be the last thing the poet would have wanted for himself. The heartbreaking reality is that the poet knows that despite his aversion to aging, there is no stopping of it. Seasons come and go. Daytime gives into night, and once roaring fires die when the fuel runs out. In the final couplet, the poet says there that the young man would see all these things, and they would make his love stronger, because his love even he because he loved even more, but he knew he is losing before them. The sonnet is either a, de a declaration of faith in the strength of the relationship between Shakespeare and his young male friend, or as a more cynical person would put it, a wistful yearning for something to remain unchanged despite change. It must be said that the images Shakespeare has selected to illustrate the point that he is aging and his death might not be too far off are all, fu all full of colors that are rapidly being overtaken by darkness. Still, the colors are still there. One might say that it is the dying fire that burns brightest. Next, let's look at the techniques the poet had used. Language. Typical, uh, the, a typical uh, Shakespearean language. Uh, the, the use of the binary me and thou establishes a sense of intimacy to the exclusion of everyone else. The disruption of the word order as in when yellow leaves or none or few signals unpredictability and insecurity the poetic person feels as a result. The use of inversion in places like, I quote, this thou perceiveth, end quote, helps to maintain the internal rhythm and to add emphasis to the perception made. The choice of black to describe night signals dislike, fear, and fear of not only night, but of death itself. The final couplet is free of imagery and overtly figurative use of language, signaling peace of mind the poetic person had arrived at due to the knowledge of the devotion of his friend. The use of, uh, next look at the uh, figurative language and imagery and sound effect. The visual images of the tree in autumn is a metaphor for old age, sickness, loss of vitality, physical weakness, etc. The auditory image of singing bird, birds is suggest suggestive of the kind of life the poet led earlier. He was sought after by other artists in contrast to the lonely life he led now. In that sense, the metaphor suggests a sense of betrayal over the infidelity of his fair weather friends. It, is, it also suggests a sense of self-loathing, anger, etc. at the poet's own narcissistic dependence on others for selfhood and self-worth. In the second quatrain, the central metaphor of late evening is essentially a visual image. Night is personified and used as a metaphor for death. As day is inevitably, as day inevit inevitably has to give into night, 
the poetic persona has to give into them. This suggests powerlessness or impotence of all living beings when confronted by this truth or the fact of life that death is inevitable. The visual image of a dying fire signals the degradation of the body and spirit as a result of our youthful usage of human faculties and the body as a whole. In order to live, we must spend its resources. However, as a result, the body degenerates. This understanding evokes sadness. Repetition of the idea, thou mayest in me behold, in slightly different ways, in lines 1, 5, 9, and 13, signals a need to confront the truth and arrive at a resolution. In the three quatrains, the repeated use of der, ber, ger, and long vowel sounds adds a solemn atmosphere to the sonnet. In contrast, in the last couplet, le and sir uh, and shorter vowel sounds are used, signaling an, a, lightening, uh, a lightening of the poet's mood. Uh, I would like to uh, leave you with some questions to ponder on. Uh, towards uh, at the end of the, the presentation. First uh, question, what three metaphors uh, does the speaker use to describe himself? What contrast between the speaker and his beloved is implied by these metaphors? What seasonal images do you see in this poem? How do these images contribute to the poem's tone of loss and sadness? Find the turn or the volta of this poem. What does the speaker tell his beloved in the final couplet? The idea in line 12 is somewhat compressed. Paraphrase it using your own words after thinking about what ordinarily the word nourished, uh, uh, nourishing, uh, uh, what ordinarily nourished the speaker's fire. I'll repeat the question. Uh, the idea in line, line 12 is some, somewhat compressed. Paraphrase it using your own words after thinking about what ordinarily nourished the speaker's fire, the fire that are now choked or consumed. With that, we come to the end of the, the, the video. Let's meet in another video uh, with uh, Sonnet 141. Goodbye. <laughs>